Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Victor Emanuel Nature Tours webinar. I'm Ben Reynolds, host and organizer of this series. Thank you for joining today's presentation. We are delighted to offer online presentations about birds, nature, and vent tours. We hope you enjoy today's topic on the art of identifying shorebirds by Michael O'Brien. During this session, all attendees may download handouts and ask questions. Please note that questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. You may email me your questions if time expires. However, if you have technical questions during our session, I'll try my best to answer them in real time to help you have the best viewing experience. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on demand anytime at your convenience, and a link to the recording will be delivered to you in an email tomorrow. Now back to our feature presentation. Michael O'Brien is a full-time vent leader, freelance artist, author, and environmental consultant living in Cape May, New Jersey. He has a passionate interest in bird vocalizations and field identification, and a serious addiction to migration and nocturnal birding. His travels have taken him throughout North and Central America and beyond. At home in Cape May, Michael serves as an associate naturalist with Cape May Bird Observatory, for whom he conducts numerous workshops and for many years conducted a fall songbird migration count. He is co-author of the Shorebirds Guide, Flight Calls of Migratory Birds, and America's 100 Most Wanted Birds, and is primary author of LarkWire, an online and handheld application for learning bird sounds. His illustrations have been widely published in books and field guides, including the National Geographic Field Guide to the Birds of North America and the new Peterson Field Guides. Michael also has an intense interest in butterflies, leads several vent birds and butterfly tours with his wife, Louise Samitis, and is coordinator of the Cape May Butterfly Count. We are thrilled to have Michael present on various techniques for identifying shorebirds, including both macro and micro field marks, and highlight several vent tours with excellent opportunities for shorebird study. We hope you enjoy today's webinar. Without further ado, I will turn the controls over to Michael. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, well, thank you, Ben. Um, I'm uh, excited to talk to you all today about uh, shorebirds, one of my favorite groups of birds. Um, shorebirds are, are uh, my favorite group for a, a lot of reasons. They're um, incredibly diverse. There's some a bunch of beautiful species, like these uh, American avocets, uh, more subtly beautiful birds like buff-breasted sandpiper. Um, and uh, and they they occur in a lot of different places. We often think of shorebirds as as uh, you know mainly in coastal areas, uh, shorelines and and beaches, but they actually occur in in quite a few other places. Uh, big big flocks can uh, can occur sometimes, um, but they they occur also in inland uh, flooded fields, um, grassland habitats uh, like this upland sandpiper, and even in wooded habitats like American woodcock. One thing that's really exciting about shorebirds is that a lot of them are really long distance travelers, uh, migrating uh, great distances from high Arctic breeding uh, habitats, breeding grounds down to um, wintering areas in temperate or tropical regions. Uh, the champion of all migrants is the bar-tailed godwit. Uh, it has been documented to travel from uh, Alaskan breeding grounds, flying nonstop for eight days uh, down to wintering areas in New Zealand. In New Zealand, that's over 7,000 miles. Just incredible. Uh, no other migratory bird has been documented to fly farther than that in one flight. One of the fun aspects of shorebirding is that it can be kind of a treasure hunt with so many species that are long distance migrants. Uh, you tend to get uh, vagrants 
showing up from time to time. Um, this redneck stint showed up in Cape May uh, a number of years ago and, and caused quite a stir. Uh, but shorebirds can also be tricky to identify. That's going to be kind of the focus of, of this webinar. Um, and there's, you know, there's a lot of reasons why shorebirds can be tricky to identify. Uh, for one thing, there's uh, a whole bunch of species, over 50 species that are regular in North America. Uh, many of them have this nasty habit of changing plumages through the seasons. Um, all There's good reasons. They... Um, uh, they want to look nice and snazzy in the in the breeding season, uh, but they also want to be camouflaged at, at all their seasons. So, um, uh, so they come in a variety of plumages as the seasons go by. Another challenge with shorebirds is that they're often uh, way out on inaccessible mud flats, and you know maybe if you finally hike way out there to get a close look, a peregrine flushes everything up. So. All kinds of reasons why uh, shorebirding can be challenging. So, how do you begin shorebird identification? Well, okay, this may seem like a weird photo for me to show, uh, but some of you may recognize Louise and me. Um, some of you may not, but that's okay. That means you probably just haven't gotten to know us yet. Uh, we hope to change that. Um, but the point is that after you spend a little time with a, a person or a bird, uh, you begin to recognize them, um, which is not really the same as identifying them. You don't really go through this long process of listing field marks. You just kind of gradually get to know them and, and, uh, and just recognize them in an instant when you see them. So really one of the first steps for learning shorebirds is getting to know your local shorebirds. Uh, I'm sure wherever you are, uh, you probably have some shorebirds nearby. And um, you know some of them are not that hard to identify, so you can kind of get a handle on, on at least some of them. Um, and then when you see something that looks a little bit different, maybe you'll, you'll notice. It's also very helpful to uh, learn what's likely in your area. Uh, there's there's bar charts that you can uh, get on eBird, uh, which are uh, it's a great resource for for learning what's around your area at, at different times of year. Because um, they do, it will change different times of year. So uh, eBird is a great resource for that. There's other resources as well, but just get to know what's likely in your area. And it also helps to get to know the distinctive ones. They're, of course, easier to learn. Um, uh, but they also, but shorebirds do tend to form mixed flocks. Um, so you can use these species that you know as reference points for other species. So I like to talk about macro field marks. Uh, these are things that you can see at a distance. And the reality is that's what, uh, you know, most of our birding, we are using macro field marks to identify birds. Um, so when I look at a flock like this, uh, what I first notice is some birds of different sizes and, um, and some slightly different shapes, especially bill shapes are kind of jumping out at me, a short thick bill on the, the upper right bird and that long bill on that middle left bird and kind of a medium length fine bill on the middle or the, the lower right bird. Um, so just different sizes and shapes. Um, and I also know where I am. I'm, I'm looking at a mud flat. That's a, that's a habitat. So that's, um, you've sort of, you've seen a, a behavior right there. So size, shape, and behavior. So uh, if any of you have the, the Peterson field guides, I'm sure most of you do. Uh, the very first thing that, that Peterson shows you when you crack open the book uh, is what I would call macro field marks. Um, all these different birds are, um, are different shapes. They're different sizes. They're doing different things, perching on the wire or clinging to a tree trunk or uh, walking on the ground. 
Um, they're all different. You're, so you're seeing different sizes, shapes, behaviors. These are macro field marks. And so Peterson knew all about that. And it was, um, you know, really a brilliant way to, to, op to you know, to start his book, uh, to see that first and then go to the, uh, all the field marks and the rest of the book. So back in 2006, when we published our shorebird guide, um, we adopted a, that similar idea. With uh, we put these shorebird silhouettes uh, right right there in the front of the book, um, so you can really see uh, the all the different sizes and shapes. Um, and it's really it's really step one to identifying birds. And uh, it's a, I think it's important to make the connection that. Uh, Bill lengths, bill shapes are adaptations to different foraging niches, and uh, also wing lengths, uh, adaptation to different migration styles. So let's look at long-billed curlew. That's a, a bird, uh, the first thing you notice with the long-billed curlew is that incredibly long decurved bill. That is actually an adaptation for its wintering grounds, for feeding on its wintering grounds, where it goes after burrowing uh, organisms like, like crabs and shrimp and, and worms. Um, it actually doesn't really need that long decurved bill on the breeding grounds where it's in the prairies uh, and the dirt is, is really hard. Uh, it really is mainly gleaning insects when it's in the prairies, right off the, off the foliage. But uh, in the winter, it needs that long decurved bill for, for burrowing critters. American oyster catcher. If uh, you look at it from the side, it looks like it has a really thick bill, from, but from the front like this, you can see it has this laterally compressed bill like a knife. And that's a, a, a really perfect tool for um, shucking oysters. Um, and also for chiseling uh, mollusks, mollusks off of rocks. And, and uh, so it's really got a, perfect tool for what it does. Ruddy turnstone has this chisel shaped bill, uh, which it uses to uh, flip over debris, dig, dig little holes in the sand and, and uh, jab mollusks off of rocks. It really is a, a useful tool for that species. Shorebirds with uh, long bills like marble godwit, um, used to use that bill to, to uh, probe deeply in the mud. Um, and they also have a, a, a prehensile uh, flexible tip to the upper mandible um, and, and very sensitive as well. So they can feel for a worm way down in the muck and they can open up just the tip of the bill, grab onto uh, that worm and pull it up out of the sand. Amazing adaptation. Um, a lot of the little peeps, that's the little small shorebirds, the peeps, like semi-palmated sandpiper, uh, they use that short bill to kind of peck at the surface, shallowly probe, um, and they also um, slurp up what they call biofilm, which just has tiny little organisms right in the top of the, in the muck layer, um, and they can, they can slurp those up with that little bill. So white rump sandpiper feeds uh, in a lot the same way as a semi-palmated sandpiper, but notice how long the wings are. Uh, that has to do with a, a different migration strategy. Both of these species are long distance migrants. Uh, they both breed up in the Arctic, but look how far south the white rump sandpiper goes. It goes all the way down to Southern South America, semi-palmated only to Northern South America. So, um, White rump is really a, a longer distance migrant. Those longer wings are an adaptation for speed so they can fly faster uh, and they can, they can get farther. So uh, when you're watching shorebirds, it's important to watch how they move. Uh, each type of shorebird has its own way of feeding. Uh, and because of this, they, they all move in slightly different ways. So in contrast to the peeps uh, that would kind of be in constant motion as they walk around and pick at the surface, uh, a plover has a, uh, this walk and stop, walk and stop feeding motion. Uh, and they, every time they stop, they're kind of looking and listening for, for any kind of movement. And then when, when they finally find something, they lean over and pluck 
pluck it from the surface of the mud. Uh, and the way they, the way plovers move, really reminds me a lot of the way American robins move um, when when they're walking around a lawn going for um, going for worms. That walk, stop, walk, stop, and then lean over and plucking up something. Phalaropes are famous for the way they uh, spin around in circles. They swim in the water and spin around in circles. Uh, they, they, by doing that, they create this vortex which draws nutrients up to the surface, uh, and that's how they feed. Dowagers tend to stay in a small area, and they use that long bill to, to probe deeply in the mud, uh, and, and they're, they stitch like a sewing machine. So a very distinctive um, feeding style for dowagers. Uh, unlike dowagers, yellow legs tend to walk around and, and kind of pick at the surface, uh, maybe probe real shallowly in the mud, but mainly they'll, they'll pick around at the surface. These are lesser yellow legs here. Greater yellow legs can feed in about the same way, just as methodical as lessers, uh, but then suddenly they'll run around chasing fish. Uh, and that is, that's a distinctive behavior. The lessers don't do that. But it, so if you see a yellow legs running around chasing fish, that's going to be a greater. So uh, using birds you know as reference points is a, a really important way to, to help identify species. Um, so if you know the black neck stilt, that's a pretty distinctive bird. Um, it can help you figure out what kind of yellow legs is sleeping there next to it. So in this case, these are greater yellow legs. They're actually, um, they don't stand as tall as a stilt because the legs are not quite as tall as long, but, um, uh, but their body is actually a little bigger. So by body size, you can tell right away um, those are greater yellow legs. By comparison, lesser yellow legs next to a stilt would be considerably smaller. And still on the yellow legs theme, if you see a, a dowager, uh, and you maybe you don't know which dowager it is, but if you know it's a dowager because it's got that distinctive feeding style, uh, and then you see a yellow legs next to it, um, uh, again, by size, you can tell these are lesser yellow legs because they're um, actually maybe a little smaller than that dowager, same size or a little bit smaller in terms of body size. So again, using birds you know uh, to help you identify the ones you don't know. Um, judging bill length can sometimes be a, a little subjective, so it's helpful to um, compare it to the depth of the head, because uh, that's you know that's not going to go away. Uh, so that's a great way to tell lesser from greater yellow legs. The um, lesser the bill is you know around the same as the depth of the head, and on greater it's usually distinctly longer. And once you begin to recognize uh, the size, shape, feeding style of a lesser yellow legs, you might start to look for something a little bit more subtle. Um, so stilt sandpiper uh, looks can look similar to a uh, yellow legs, but it's um, a little bit smaller body, a little bit longer bill. Sometimes they look like they have a droop at the tip of the bill. And they feed a little bit differently. They, they don't just pick at the surface. They'll also probe a little bit. Uh, a little bit like a dowager, a little stitching like a dowager. So then compare it to a dowager, um, a little shorter bill, uh, a little longer legs, um, again, smaller body size. Um, so in a, in a lot of ways, a stilt sandpiper looks intermediate between a dowager and a stilt sandpiper. So, um, uh, and they feed again, a little bit like dowagers, they'll, they'll stitch in the mud, but then they'll walk around in between. More dowagers tend to stay in one small area, and they don't, you know, they don't walk around too much. Um, so a little bit different feeding style. It's always good to to consider the habitats where you are. Uh, a lot of species will occur on mud flats, but not everything does. Piping plovers are are. Uh, really known for their, uh, they use sandy beaches or gravel beaches. 
upland sandpiper, as I've talked about, uses uh, uh, dry prairie grasslands. They're kind of restricted to, to grasslands. They don't they don't use mud flats hardly at all. Purple sandpipers on the east coast, rock sandpipers on the west coast. They both like to use these rocky uh, shorelines. Solitary sandpipers tend to use uh, small pools close to vegetation. Uh, they like to have places to hide or nearby places to hide. So yeah, small pools near vegetation. Spotted sandpipers will use really any kind of shoreline, but they, they don't seem to like to get their feet wet, or at least not very much. So don't look for them out in the middle of the water. They're, they're really gonna be right along the edge. Semi-pollinated and western sandpipers, they, they like to use these big open tidal mudflats. Leaf sandpiper, on the other hand, tends to use more marginal habitats with smaller openings and often darker substrates, uh, which, is, um, which is good camouflage for them because they're actually a little darker in color. So that brings me to color. Uh, general color patterns can be really, really helpful. Um, that does require some knowledge of what plumage the birds are in, um, but they still provide some good macro field marks, things you can see at a distance. So here we have Dunlin and Western Sandpiper. So in addition to the, the Dunlin is on the right, in addition to it being larger and longer build, uh, look at that color pattern. It's a darker tone of gray and also has more of a hooded look, uh, darker across the throat and breast uh, than the uh, Western Sandpipers. So take those same two species and add a, another one. You have Dunlin, a couple Dunlins here, and, and Western Sandpipers, and then this bigger bird, this is a Dowager, uh, compared to Dunlin is a, a little bigger, longer build, well, you can't see the bill there, but it's bigger. Uh, but has a similar pattern, that similar uh, darker gray tone on the back and a nice hood across the, the uh, breast. Um, and if you look more subtly, you can see it has these markings kind of running down the, the flanks and under tail coverts, whereas the Dunlin is pretty clean white there. So here again, we have Western Sandpiper on the left. Uh, and the bird on the right is a sanderling, a little bigger than a Western, uh, paler overall, especially very white looking on the head. And here we have leaf sandpiper next to a Western. So Western is our, is our point of reference here. We've been looking at that compared to a bunch of other things. So compared to a Western, a leaf is smaller and darker and browner and kind of dingy across the throat and breast, leaving the only place that's really bright white on a least is down on the belly, not so bright white on the throat or breast. And sometimes uh, back color can be a striking difference as it is here with semi-palmated and piping plovers. So the semi-palmated is really kind of the color of wet mud, the piping, the color of dry sand. So here they're together. A lot of times they're, they sort out by their habitats, but of course, uh, birds do mer you know, merge into each other's habitats a little bit. So, uh, but that color will help you sort them out. So when birds take off and fly, um, Rump and wing patterns can be really helpful. And, uh, and also, don't forget to listen. Uh, this, we don't really have the format here for me to talk about voice very much, uh, but let's just say voice can be a very important uh, field mark for identifying shorebirds. And they do call a lot when they fly. Okay, let's talk about micro field marks. So of course, these are things that you need a close look to see. Um, you don't necessarily see a magnifying, need a magnifying glass, but you need to be close, a good scope. 
Um, some things you, you don't need uh, to really know what plumage the bird's in, like the, um, looking at the hind toe or lack of a hind toe. Semi-palmated sandpipers have hind toes. Sanderlings do not. All the, most of the little peeps, all the little peeps have hind toes, except sanderling does not. Uh, that's actually, that hind toe is a, a perching toe. Um, when they're on the breeding grounds, we think of these things uh, as just walking around in the mud, but when they're on the breeding grounds, they actually sit up in little shrubs or small trees uh, and, and sing. And um, the semi-pollinated sandpipers and most of those little peeps, they need that hind toe to help them perch. Well, a sanderling is a much higher Arctic species, and there's, there's just gravel and, and dirt up there and tundra. Uh, nothing to really perch on, so they don't need that hind toe. Also, look at that little gape notch. Sanderlings have it, and semi palmateds don't. Primary projection is something you may hear people talk about a lot. Um, uh, it's a great way to tell a bared sandpiper from a semi palmated sandpiper. Um, here you're seeing the uh, the blacker feathers. Those are the primaries, and those uh, the browner uh, pale edged feathers that are above or in front of them are um, are the tertial feathers. So there, those feathers are are resting on top of the primaries, but those uh, exposed blackish feathers that's the primary projection. So bared sandpiper, kind of like white rump sandpiper, is another very long winged species, and uh, they migrate long distances. And so those longer wings help them fly faster, and uh, and you can see those long wings when they're when they're perching, or when they're when they're standing there. And also notice um, you can't really see the tail too well in the semi-palmated, but you can see it on the bairds. Uh, the wings go way past the tail tip here too. So how far the wings go past the tail is another helpful feature. So if you're studying flocks and flocks of semi-palmated plovers, hoping to find a common ringed plover, one feature you might want to keep an eye out for is the, the orbital ring color. So orbital ring is, a, is the ring of bare skin around the eye. It's not feathers. That would be an eye ring. But the orbital ring is bare skin around the eye. And the orbital ring on a semi-palmated plover is yellow. And on a common ringed plover, it's black. So if you're close enough to see that, uh, you, that, you might be able to pick out a common ringed plover. There's other things to look for too, but that's, that's one of the micro field marks to look for on common ringed plover. So for most uh, micro field marks, you need to know what plumage your, your bird is in. Um, and I could probably do a whole talk on, on aging shorebirds, but um, just to summarize, what we have here is the you know four kind of main plumage types that you might see on a western sandpiper, um, and there it's, this is a good example for shorebirds in general. The the juvenile, it's helpful to realize that the only time in a bird's life that it grows all of its feathers in at the same time uh, is is a, is juvenile plumage. When this bird is uh, hatching and, it, and it's got the down and then it starts to grow all those feathers. It grows all of them at the same time. Uh, after that, birds are going to drop one feather, grow another one in, and, and, uh, and so forth. And it gives you this kind of uh, model-y, messy look. Uh, subsequent plumage is when they're molting. So a juvenile, which, is, which we see in the, in the late summer and fall, around July to October, um, have this beautiful uh, pristine look, uh, fresh plumage with neat pale edging. Um, a lot of the little peeps tend to have a scaly pattern, this real neat scaly pattern. So juveniles are really, really fresh and pristine looking at the same time that adults are kind of messy looking because they have worn breeding plumage feathers and then they're getting in some fresh non-breeding plumage feathers. So they get this messy mixture at the same time, the juveniles look nice and pretty. Um, so that's a good thing to look for in late summer and fall when you have those two sort of plumage types next to each other. Uh, in the winter, a lot of species are sort of plain gray and white. Um, 
And in the breeding season, they'll, uh, a lot of species will molt in some brighter colors. Um, for, you know, a lot of times they want to have some nice flashy colors for, uh, for their breeding displays. Um, so you might see a little more color on a lot of birds, especially on the head or the underparts, um, which, uh, which is because they can hide those when they're sitting on their nests. So uh, think about a bird up in the Arctic tundra. Uh, it has this nice flashy pattern for, for breeding, but it also wants to hide on its nest. So most shorebirds, as bright as they may be, still have a sort of a camouflage pattern of some sort on their backs. So let's look at uh, western and semi-palmated sandpipers for a minute. Um, these are two birds that are uh, a lot of people have trouble telling apart. Um, bill length is one thing that's um, uh, a, a generally a feature to look at. The western sandpiper tends to have a longer bill, and the semi-palmated uh, tends to have a shorter bill, uh, maybe a little thicker tip, typically on semi-palmated. But there's variation uh, in that, as you can see with these photos. It's not always obvious. Uh, females, in generally speaking, have longer bills than males. Um, so that's part of the, the reason for variation. Uh, Westerns also tend to have a lot more bright color on the upper parts and the, the head, uh, a lot of that rufous color in the breeding season. Um, but then semi-palmated can sometimes show that too, like this one here is a, a slightly brighter semi-palmated in the spring, that upper right bird. So a really good thing to look for uh, is, uh, to, or to look at, I should say, is the belly. Um, uh, Western sandpipers have these little triangular spots. This is now, I'm talking about breeding plumage only breeding plumage, they have these uh, little triangular spots on the belly. And semi-palmateds, as much streaking as they may get on the chest or, or spilling down the flanks, they really don't have any markings on the belly. So look for those, um, look for those belly, triangular belly spots. And in the fall, uh, in the late, late summer, I should say, when, when they're changing over from breeding plumage, they're getting quite drab uh, and starting to get some of those plain gray feathers molting in. Um, Westerns sort of hold those little belly spots for quite a while, uh, for quite a while into the fall. Um, so, so look for those telltale little triangular belly spots to help tell a, a Western from a semi-palmated. Okay, dowagers. Um, so, so dowagers are notoriously tricky to identify. Uh, so I'll talk about them a little bit here. Um, if you know your dowager is a juvenile, which uh, step one, you have to know it's know what plumage it's in. Uh, these these birds are both juveniles because they have this these neatly arranged feathers, um, all of them kind of uh, kind of in, in in good order. The birds look kind of clean and fresh. So these are both juvenile birds. Uh, well, that's about as easy as a identification gets uh, with dowagers. Uh, these juveniles because the short bills have all these internal markings on those big feathers on the rear of the wing, the, the tersals and the greater coverts, uh, whereas long bills have little to no internal markings on those, uh, those same feathers. Um, so that's about as easy, as uh, straightforward as dowager ID gets. Uh, breeding plumage dowagers um, can, be, can be really tricky. Um, especially in kind of the middle of the continent where you have these brighter colored short-billed dowagers. Um, they're the ones that are going to look more like long-billed because they have more rufous uh, coloration on the undersides. Uh, so if you have a nice close look at one of these, that's, that's what this one on the right here, it's that in interior migrating, uh, the subspecies is called Henderson eye, uh, this interior migrating uh, short-billed dowager. There's a number of little things you can look for. Look for the, um, the speckles on the throat. Long bill has a bunch of little speckles on the throat. Short bill has few or none. Uh, the sides of the breast, short bill has these little spots or nice distinct spots, I should say. Long bill has bars. Uh, and then down on the belly, short bills still have a few spots. Long bills have no spots. So, you're looking in particular parts of the bird uh, to look for particular types of markings. 
So, um, so this is a case where you really have to know exactly where you're looking and and what you're looking for. But you can tell them apart this way. It's it's they're very very good field marks, but you have to know exactly what you're looking for. So if we can get close views like this, that's that's wonderful. Uh, but that doesn't happen all that often. And and frankly, I tend to um, use those macro field marks a little bit more than the micro field marks, just because that's what's available. Um, that's the reality of, of birding in the field, is that those macro field marks tend to be more useful. So if you just take a few steps back from these two dowagers, uh, another feature becomes a little bit more apparent, um, where, the, where the color is. Um, and, and maybe maybe changing the names of the birds would help. If you change long build to red-bellied dowager and short build to red-breasted dowager, they become a little easier to tell apart when you're um, you know taking a few steps back. So just look where that color is. The long bill, it's it's actually more of a brick red color, and it's brightest on the belly. It becomes a little duller up by the the throat and neck. And the short bill, uh, brightest on the on the throat and breast. Um, Sometimes it goes well down the belly. A lot of times there's white on the belly, uh, but it's usually brightest right up there in the throat and breast, and often a, an orangey tone. So just looking at uh, plumage patterns, uh, just general plumage uh, color distribution uh, is really helpful if you can't get close enough to see those those little micro field marks. So here I can quiz you. I can't I can't hear your answers, but uh, can you tell which is which? There's there's one of each dowager here, and I can give you a hint. One is a has a red belly and one has a red breast. So if you see these dowagers hold their wings up, there's another field mark that's helpful. The uh, kind of the armpit area is uh, has is quite whitish on a long bill and and quite a bit duller, not so whitish on a short bill. And and that actually is uh, is visible in winter too. Um, so if you happen to get a good look at a winter plumage dowager uh, and see that nice sharply defined whitish patch on the the leading edge of the underwing, uh, that's a good feature for long billed dowager. Short billed really doesn't show it quite as much. So I will end with that, and um, uh, I'll uh, just point out some different tours that are, have good opportunities for shorebird study. Um, and I'll, I'll just talk about them for a minute here. The High Island Migration Tour, so that's on the Upper Texas Coast, and uh, that is uh, got some wonderful shorebirding at Bolivar Flats, and uh, there, there's rice fields, uh, which are really fun to bird in. You got to time time the uh, the flooding of the rice fields just right to uh, uh, to get shorebirds in there but it's some they really attract lots and lots of birds so so that's a lot of fun um, spring in Cape May uh, we have some amazing uh, shorebird opportunities in spring in Cape May the uh, the Delaware Bay shore is famous for its concentrations of red knots in particular but a lot of other species of shorebirds uh, that gather to feed on on the eggs of horseshoe crabs uh, in the um, uh, that are that are spawning and laying their eggs along the beaches of the Delaware Bay, uh, so um, thousands and thousands of shorebirds, uh, most famously red knot, uh, gather there in the spring. Fall in Cape May is also a good time. We don't get the same concentrations as we do in the spring, but we uh, have a, an interesting mix of plumages. You get those juvenile plumages and those molting adult plumages. So. Uh, lots of fun with shorebirds. There's there's lots of good shorebird spots uh, that we uh, that we go to on that fall Cape May tour. So always plenty to see there. And uh, and the Rockport area um, for next uh, next November, the uh, event is having their 45th anniversary celebration, and we are doing a little uh, post tour extension up to the Rockport area to look at whooping cranes. Uh, but there's lots of other birds in that same area. Uh, and um, shorebirds are, are just wonderful there. They're everywhere. Everywhere you go, there's more shorebird habitat. Uh, so there you get to see birds in their winter plumages. Um, so lots and lots to see on, on all those tours. 
So at this point, I'd be happy to take any questions that anyone has. Michael, thank you for that wonderful presentation. I think we'll we'll all take a minute to uh, internalize that information and digest it. Uh, we'll we'll start getting some questions in from the audience. Uh, Marilyn says, best shorebird presentation I've seen. Great relationships. Thank you. Thank you. That's nice. Uh, Pat has a question. Could you tell us more about the gape notch? The gape notch. Well, I can tell you what it looks like. I can't tell you what it's for. Uh, I mean, this is just the, um, the basically the side of the mouth. Uh, and for whatever reason, on a sanderling, it, there's this little notch that sticks back visibly. And on a semi-palmated and western and least sandpipers, uh, it's it's really not hardly, there's little or no notch visible there. So it's just a stupid little thing that's different. Um, can't explain why it's different. Um, Carol asks, what are your preferred binoculars for shore birding? Can you talk about the difference between the powers of magnification? Well, that's a good question. I, I you know, and I, and that's going to be everyone's going to have their own answer to that. I think um, for me, I use the same binoculars for everything because my binoculars are kind of an extension of my eyes. So um, I, um, I I use eight forty two uh, binoculars. I, I happen to have Leicas, which are wonderful. Um, and they're um, and I use them for shorebirding. I use them for looking at warblers or sparrows or sea watching. Um, you know, I, it's it's I could certainly say that when you're looking at more distant things like shorebirds on a mudflat, I could I could see wanting 10 power binoculars. You know, a little more power, but you are giving up field of view. And for those moments when everything flies, like the peregrine comes through and everything flies, um, you're um, you're at a little disadvantage with uh, the narrower field of view that you get with 10 power binoculars. So, um, you know, so you want that big field of view. So it's always, uh, there's always this trade-off between field of view and magnification. So I, I always just like my 842s. Michael, can you also extend that into photography? What, what lenses do you use? And then also when you take a picture in the field like that, do you often zoom into that photo to, identify the bird? So um, same idea, I guess, with binoc as with binoculars. You want, um, if the birds are just sitting there, having higher magnification is great. Uh, and if the birds are suddenly take off and you want to get a picture in flight, having a wider field of view is a big advantage. So um, for me, I, don't happen to have 20 different lenses, so I don't I don't have a, a I don't have to decide which lens I'm going to take today. I have a fixed 300 millimeter lens, and that's what I sorry a 400, uh, and that's what I use most of the time. Uh, I do have a I do have a zoom lens also a, a one to a one to 400 zoom, uh, and I find that quite versatile. It doesn't happen to focus as fast uh, as my fixed 400, so um, which is a good, you want that fast focus, especially when you're taking pictures of birds in flight. So, um, so I, um, if I know I'm taking pictures of birds that are sitting, uh, the zoom is fine. Um, and, um, and it actually focuses closer. So if I'm going to suddenly switch to taking pictures of butterflies, I want that close focus. Uh, so it has a versatility. Um, but, um, for shorebirds, generally, I you know you wouldn't need a lens like that. So I would say that fixed 400 is great for shorebirds. Good. Here's a question from uh, Mary Lou. Um, could you talk again about the difference of the bill length between the long billed and short billed dowager? Okay, I don't think I actually talked about bill length. Um, they they are um, different on average. So uh, I did mention. Uh, when I was talking about Western Sandpiper, I talked about how the 
the males have shorter bills, the females have longer bills. That's true of most shorebirds, and that's true of dowagers as well. Uh, so female long-billed dowagers are the ones with those really monster long bills. Um, and the male short-billed dowagers are the ones with the, the quite short-looking bills. Both of those ends of the extreme are very distinctive. So that's half of the dowagers out there have distinctive bill lengths. Um, the other half, the, the male long bills and the female short bills, they're pretty similar. So, you know, so you can, you can identify maybe half of them, half the dowagers out there on bill lengths and the other half, you're, you're not sure. The other aspect of the bill on dowagers, the shape's a tiny bit different. The long bill has a slightly more tapered, a thinner looking bill that's, that tapers to a slightly finer tip. Um, and short builds a little heavier bill, uh, which often has this weird kink in it, uh, but that's that's pretty subtle and not always there. So, but the, but there's some other other things about the bill to look at. But um, so dowager bills are useful, um, but not always diagnostic. A follow-up to that, uh, Lori asked, are there more tips for winter dowagers? I can get close views, but still find them difficult. Yeah. Uh, there's, yeah, for sure. Um, there's a lot of subtle things. The um, uh, the breast pattern may be one of the, mo the most useful. The long bill tends to have this kind of solid, uh, solid looking smudgy breast band, whereas the short bill tends to have a, a little bit of a speckly look to that breast band. Um, and in, in most areas, long bills are darker looking. Uh, when I say most areas, I shouldn't say that. Uh, when you're in when you're in the middle of the country uh, and on the east coast, the long bills have a darker look about them. When you're on the west coast, the west coast subspecies of short bill is quite dark also. Uh, so they they don't strike me as as paler than than long bills. But when I see dowagers in the east, um, they the long bills tend to look darker to me than than the short bills. They also, the long bills have a, uh, a little bit of a darker shading toward the center of all those feathers on the back. And, um, and those, uh, so I can sometimes see a, a, a flatter looking tone of gray on the short bills and, a, and a, that sort of darker center on the, the feathers of a long bill. But that, it's, it's um, one of the reasons I didn't get into winter plumage dowagers is because it varies a little bit by the subspecies of short build. Uh, so it's hard to come up with rules that work um, everywhere you are. Well, that brings me to a point, Michael, that we had talked about you presenting another webinar on a similar or maybe uh, different topic and would like to let our audience know that if there are certain topics that you would like to hear from Michael, uh, please email me, ben at ventbird.com. Uh, and if, Michael, there's anything that you would like to add to that about how you might like to design a webinar for our vent audience. Well, sure. We were just talking earlier, Ben and I were just talking about um, different possibilities for other webinars. And, and one is that just if folks want to send in photos uh, and, uh, and you know, we can, we can talk about, uh, talk about what they are and why. Um, and and that can kind of spark conversations about or discussions about um, you know different ID issues. So um, yeah, there's a lot of possibilities there. Great. Well, then let me take a minute here to tell everybody about our upcoming webinar. East is east and west is west. The sparrows of winter by Rick Wright. Many of our New World sparrows have vast coast-to-coast -coast ranges, while others are restricted to much smaller regions for breeding. In winter, though, all bets are off. This is a season when birds from the west drift east and birds from the east stray west, often appearing beneath the feeders of keen-eyed birders. Join Rick Wright for a discussion of these long-distance wanderers and their identification. You just might discover one in your own backyard. Now we have time for a few more questions. Uh, Elaine says, great presentation. Thanks from New Brunswick, Canada. Are there any species that we should expect to see more along Atlantic coast in the next years? Maybe some expanding their range? 
Hmm. Um, that's an interesting question. I, I don't know that there's anything that you should really expect necessarily. I know one, one species that has started to generally wander uh, more than it used to is southern lapwing. So if you dig out your South American field guide and see what a southern lapwing looks like, there's a, a growing number of records of that bird um, kind of popping a little farther north than expected. There's even a record in Maryland uh, and maybe a Florida record or something like that. So that's one that could um, that could come north. Um, but I think, well, I, and if I understand the question right, it maybe has to do with uh, with climate change and with southern species maybe wandering north a little bit. And um, I'm not sure that that with shorebirds, there's too many options for birds to move north. There's there's some beach nesters like Wilson's plover, um, which uh, you might think maybe they would expand north a little bit. But but the other side of that is is that with Sea, sea level rise, their habitats are getting more and more limited. So I don't expect them to really start to expand north. Um, so anyway, I hope that answers the question. Randy has a question. Could you please discuss the leg colors of Western versus least sandpipers? Right, another thing I didn't point out. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so Western uh, uh, sandpipers tend to have blackish legs or you know dark gray at least. Um, and least are quite yellowish. And um, yeah, I probably didn't point that out when I was talking about macro field marks because the reality is uh, that's kind of bordering on a micro field mark. It's, it's something that you have to be a little closer to see. And, and when uh, the birds are a bit farther away, you can still tell Western and least pretty easily by size and shape and color. Um, and uh, but that those yellow legs, that's a great field mark for for least. Now the caveat, as I think everyone has has heard people talk about this, um, these little guys walk around in the mud, so they can get their their feet all muddied up, and and they can all look like they have black legs. So that's just the caveat there. Uh, David says I was once challenged with a dowager individual in a small wetland on a Cuba tour. I heard from the local guide that long-billed dowagers prefer smaller wetlands compared to that of short-billed dowagers. Is this a reliable field mark? Um, well, uh, I, I, it's a generalization. So um, there, there is a generalization that that short-billed dowagers, and and part of this is uh, what you're talking, whether you're talking about winter or migration. Um, there's a difference in, in habitat a little bit during winter. So in winter, uh, short bills tend to be on kind of tidal flats, kind of open tidal flats um, on the coast, whereas long bills uh, are, are also are inland as well as in kind of generally smaller pools near the coast, um, not typically out on those big open tidal flats. Um, but that's one of those never say never things that a long bill could wander into one of those tidal flats and a short bill could stray inland to a little pool. But, but generally speaking, inland dowagers are in the winter are long bills and coastal dowagers in the winter are mainly short bills with maybe a few long bills. Uh, now in migration, um, all bets are off because they, they're all using everything that they can find. So it's just sort of a, a helpful generalization uh, that mainly has to do with winter. Now, here's a, a similar question. It might be overlapping and yet unique in its own way. Aaron asks, can you comment on the inland versus coastal areas in Belize and why when it comes uh, to short build versus long build dowagers? So which is more common in each of these areas and why? Uh, well, in Belize, dowagers are pro well, you know, in, 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 in the winter in Belize, uh, if you have a dowager at an inland site, um, like a, you know, just, just some interior pond or something, that's very likely to be a long build. Uh, and if you have one out on a coastal estuary, 
uh, that's a, a great place for a short build. It's, I would not say it's guaranteed to be a short build, uh, but it's certainly where you would expect a short build. And, and um, if you see a short build on a kind of isolated pond, it's probably going to be an isolated pond that's pretty close to the coast. Um, but having said that, my, again, migration, um, when the birds are moving through, you can get a short bill at any of those, like anywhere in Belize, any ponds, you can get a short bill dropping in during migration. So a big part of that is, is uh, just know what time of year it is. Um, is the whiteness, Scott asked, is the whiteness of the face helpful or trustable in separating the Western from the, the WISA, from the CISA in basic plumage? Sorry, which birds? The Western Sandpiper. Oh, Western Sandpiper and Semi-Palmated Sandpiper. And, and okay, it's Western and Semi-Palmated Sandpiper, the whiteness of the face. Mm -hmm. Is that a reliable in separating the two? Um, I not, I don't think really, no. I mean, you're, with with those, it's uh, very subtle. You're looking at bill colors. I'm not sorry, not bill. You're looking at bill shapes. Um, there's a subtle difference in the um, the way the gray is shade, the, the shading of the gray on the on the back and, and around the sides of the neck and and sides of the breast. Uh, Semi's a little has slightly smudgier looking markings. Western a little more streaked looking markings. Um, I. I I, I do think Western tends to be paler in the face and maybe paler in the back too. Um, but but it's one of those things you really need a suite of characters to identify, to, to distinguish those two. Um, they're not, um, they're, they're hard in winter plumage. Definitely. Well, we have time for a few more questions. Um, Carolyn asked, how do you differentiate between a golden plover Backed bellied plover from a distance. Um, well, size and shape. You know, let's say let's say they're backlit. Um, so size and shape. A golden plover is a is a slimmer looking bird with longer wings, a uh, smaller head, and a slimmer bill. Um, so uh, so I would start with that, and then after that, you know, it depends on what plumage you're talking about. If it's a if it's say a, a non breeding plumage bird, a, a Golden plover tends to have a browner tone to the back, and um, a um, a little bit more of an eyebrow stripe, a darker cap, and a stronger eyebrow stripe. Um, and in juvenile plumage, the the golden plovers have uh, a warmer tone, has have more of those gold markings. Uh, but black bellies can have that too. Uh, uh, but the, so the face pattern is is helpful. Uh, again, a darker cap and a bold eyebrow on the golden plover. Uh, but it, it kind of keeps coming back to the to that silhouette, the size and the shape. They're, they're um, golden is a slimmer bird, longer wings, longer primary projection, uh, slimmer bill. So all those features are helpful. Carol wonders about um, the shorebird guide. Uh, she found the one from 2006 and wonders is there a newer version available? That's the one. That's the that's the one and only. Yeah, it's, we haven't uh, revised that. So I don't, uh, I don't know if we're planning to. Um, I mean, we're not. We we have not talked about revising that. So that's the one. Tim asks, are there uh, any locations on the East Coast that would give birders a better chance of finding stints? Um, nope. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I would I would say go wherever uh, birds concentrate. You know, uh, I that's really the only thing I could tell you. Uh, places that you tend to see a lot of birds, there's you know more more birds to pick through. Uh, the higher your chances are of finding something different. That's you know, that's about all I can tell you with that. Well, I want to thank you, Michael, for your presentation today, and I want to thank everybody in the audience and for everybody that sent in questions. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks everybody for coming. And we'll look forward to seeing you uh, in the near future. And if you have any questions that you have, uh, please send them to me, ben at bentbird.com. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye.